Hundreds of thousands of years ago, our ancestors ignited their first flames. Ever since, people have developed faster, safer, and more convenient ways to cook. But with each new development, we've moved further away from the old ways of cooking, further away from the fires that forged us. Still, on hot summer nights, in a little place we like to call America, the call of the flame beckons us back outside to cook. Today on Weird History Food, we're uncovering how the backyard barbecue became an American pastime. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Foods channel and let us know in the comments below what other national cooking traditions you would like to hear about. All right, grab yourself a beer and a handful of party poppers because it's time to fire up the grill. While people have been cooking animals over fire for just about as long as there have been animals and people to cook them, the term barbecue has its origins in the New World. In the 15th and 16th centuries, the Spanish began to explore and to colonize the Caribbean. In the West Indies, they came upon the Taino people, who had a special practice for slow roasting meat and fish on wooden frames set over an open flame. The Spanish recognized the future potato chip flavoring potential of this cooking technique and were intrigued. The Taino had a specific name for this practice, which the Spanish transcribed as barbacoa. From there, the term slowly warmed its way from Spanish to English. Its first known English usage came in 1661, when Captain Edmund Hickeringle wrote an early form of it in his exploratory document, Jamaica Viewed. Over the 50 years that followed, the term would become commonplace in the Anglo-American lexicon. It was only a matter of time before they tried hosting one of these barbecues for themselves. The first detailed account of an Anglo-American barbecue comes from Edward Ward's 1707 publication, The Barbecue Feast, or The Three Pigs of Peckham, Broiled Under an Apple Tree. Man, even the cookbooks back then sounded vaguely haunted. In the book, Ward details a delicious meal found in Peckham, Jamaica, cooked after the West Indian manner, wherein the meat was slathered with a sauce made from green Virginia pepper and Madeira wine. Once North American colonists caught wind of what their neighbors to the south were up to, they wanted in on the fun too. By the mid-1700s, barbecuing grew into a colonial American pastime, particularly in Virginia, where American settlers would take advantage of summer weather by smoking whole animals over pits of fire. Nothing helps beat that summer heat like a hell mouth of roasted pork. I want to eat barbecue. And mind you, don't go planning with any other girl, because I'm mighty jealous. Apparently, George Washington himself wrote extensively about the practice, spelling barbecue three different ways throughout his writings, and identifying early on the need for a universal three-letter acronym. As the 18th century gave way to the 19th, barbecues became the plaything for politicians. These early political leaders would try to garner votes by hosting Independence Day barbecues. Potential voters, wafted into these political rallies by the scent of simmering meat, would show up in droves for the pork, but would stay for the impassioned speeches on the nation's future and the baked bean wrestling. As this practice became particularly widespread in the South, it naturally caught on among the nation's enslaved residents as well. Gathering together for outdoor cooking soon became a cultural cornerstone of American slave communities, and Southern Black American cuisine has been influenced by it ever since. Meanwhile, settlers of the American West, many of whom had found their fortunes ranching, often had to cook over open flames during long cattle drives. Cowboys were regularly fed with the least valuable cuts of meat, which is a polite way of saying the worst, to get them through any given job. Among these, the beef brisket became a particularly reviled throwaway. It was tough and stringy, and no one wanted it, like leather chewing gum. Because it was terrible, it made the perfect cut to feed to workers. But innovating cowboys faced the issue head on. They quickly discovered that if they let the brisket cook for six or seven hours, it became a delectable treat, worthy of the fanciest roadhouse restaurant, if only they thought to invent those. It's through these various avenues that regional styles and flavor profiles first emerged on the American barbecue scene. Even with all that variety, though, building a barbecue pit and lighting all that wood was no easy task. Why even bother eating if you have to do all that work? Hardly seems worth it. It wasn't until new innovations came onto the scene that barbecue became an all-American summer tradition. In 1897, Pennsylvania inventor Ellsworth B. A. Warrior patented the world's first charcoal briquettes. 
Though charcoal itself had been created and used by humans for thousands of years, Zwoyer's briquettes would allow charcoal to be mass-produced for the first time and easily shipped to store shelves. But waiting just around the corner was the man who would steal Zwoyer's coal-fired thunder. That man was Edward G. Kingsford, and if you've ever eaten a burnt hot dog in a distant relative's backyard, you've probably seen his name before. In 1890, Kingsford married one of Henry Ford's cousins, and he was subsequently hired by Ford to locate a steady supply of hardwood for the production of the Model T. While later touring Ford's manufacturing facility, Kingsford found that a lot of his hard-sought hardwood supply was going to waste. But like spotting a money clip in a public toilet, Kingsford saw an opportunity in that waste. He convinced Ford to open up another manufacturing facility next door, one that took the Model T's leftover wood scraps and turned them into charcoal briquettes. And thus, the supervillainously named Ford Iron Mountain Plant was born, later to be renamed the Kingsford Company. Marrying that sister turned out to be a real smart career move. With the mass production of charcoal briquettes, barbecue was closer than ever to becoming a backyard staple. But there was still a technical issue that needed to be addressed. Up to this point, grilling usually required the construction of a big pit out of a pile of bricks, a process you may recognize as an absolute pain in the ass. Even worse, shoddy craftsmanship often led to uneven cooking, and it was difficult to regulate both the level of heat and the amount of smoke being generated. In other words, most Americans just couldn't do it right. Luckily, George Steffen came to the rescue of all our future cookouts. Stefan was a welder for Weber Brothers Metalworks, a manufacturer based out of Palatine, Illinois. At work, he welded together steel buoys for the Coast Guard on the Great Lakes. At home, though, he loved to grill up steaks in his backyard barbecue pit. While on the job, Stephen got to thinking, what if he could mix his professional expertise with the noble art of backyard meats? What if he could replace the brick pit he had at home with something entirely new, something that would allow him to better control the way he grilled? Sufficiently inspired, Stefan took some rounded steel from the Metalworks buoys and built a mock-up of the world's first spherical grill. He used half of a buoy as a basin for his charcoal, fashioned a lid out of some spare rounded metal, and slapped three legs to its bottom. And lo, unto the world, George's barbecue kettle was born. He took his new invention to the Weber brothers and the rest, as they say, is grillstery. Well, somebody says that anyway. A novelty apron, probably. After the end of World War II, thousands of U.S. military personnel remained stationed in the South Pacific. While there, many fell in love with local cultures, and they brought back home with them a hodgepodge of homages to the places they'd been. What emerged was a sort of vague impression of South Pacific culture, mass-produced for the American suburbs in the 1950s. Returning servicemen opened up tiki bars, placed tiki torches and pink flamingos on their patios, and replaced their whiskeys and their gins with tequilas and rums, all sipped out of ceramic tiki cups, of course. But why deck out your patio with tropical-themed kitsch if no one's around to see it? These veterans soon began to throw backyard luau's, and they adopted the South Pacific practice of cooking over open flames. As the practice grew and these early backyard cookers searched for easier ways to grill outdoors, they landed on George Steffen's 1951 invention. Charcoal was easier to cook with than wood, and George's barbecue kettle removed the need for scarring your immaculate green grass lawn with a big brick pit. Though other products predated Stefan's invention by a handful of years, none took off quite like his kettle. By the mid-1950s, George's barbecue kettle had become synonymous with backyard barbecue. Just a few years after its release, it got a fancy redesign and was renamed the Weber Kettle. Based on its out-of-this-world appearance, though, the Weber Kettle was commonly nicknamed Sputnik. The famous Weber barbecue kettle for Christmas. As a gift, it's never out of season. Seeing the growing clamor for outdoor grilling, companies like Coleman and Charm Glow, who had each been manufacturing gas grills for some time, tapped into this growing home grilling market. Gas grills had been around since the 1930s, but were mostly used in restaurants. However, in the 1940s, they were re-engineered for portability and produced en masse for wartime cooking. One such grill was the Model 520 Coleman Military Burner, also known as the GI Pocket Stove. You uh, can't actually fit it in your pocket, unless you're wearing hammer pants or something. Weighing in at just three pounds, this portable gas grill was shipped overseas by the thousands. 
Making its first appearance in World War II's North African campaigns, it became an essential component of frontline cooking. But this gas gravy train couldn't last forever. At the close of the war, military demand for the portable gas grills plummeted, and the companies that made them had to pivot. They rebranded their grills for the consumer market, and they grabbed tight onto the coattails of charcoal grilling. With this newly emerging competitive market, and an American populace that consumed twice the meat of their European contemporaries during this period, backyard barbecue took off as an American pastime, and it hasn't slowed down in the 70 years since. Gee, Mom, I'm starving. Let's get at this all-American meat. We were eating so much meat back then, we simply couldn't cook it all in the kitchen. Since the meteoric rise of backyard grilling, the practice has extended far beyond Independence Day. It's become a tradition for both Labor Day and Memorial Day as well. According to one 2020 poll, 68% of U.S. adults grill for the fourth, while 56 grill for each of the other two holidays. We assume most of the poll's participants also checked yes next to the option that said, any excuse to whip out the grill, really. Today, gas grills are the most popular type of grill, with about 60% of U.S. households owning at least one. Charcoal grills are a close second, with about 50% of households owning one. But in recent years, different forms of outdoor cooking have also grown in popularity. Sales have been on the rise for pellet smokers, electric smokers, outdoor pizza ovens, turkey fryers, and flat top griddles. There has also been a sort of renaissance for grilling accessories, seeing the proliferation of pizza stones, broiling baskets, and cooking planks. What's more, outdoor cooking enthusiasts the nation over no longer restrict their grilling to summer nights. 63% of grill owners report using their grills year-round, and 43% admit to grilling during the dead of winter. You'd be hard-pressed to find an American with a mustache who doesn't consider snow to be grilling weather. 11% say they've even made breakfast on their grill. It's unclear whether they cooked pancakes and eggs or just made some hot dogs in the morning. Over the years, grill enthusiasts have also made their craft into a competitive enterprise. Among the U.S.'s most notable competitions, the World Food Championships features a grilling category with historic face-offs in a variety of disciplines, including barbecue, burgers, and brisket. The Kansas City Barbecue Society also helps put on dozens of major events throughout the year, including the McClough, Kansas Barbecue Blowout, the Lafayette, Georgia Honeybee Barbecue Competition, and the Owatonna, Minnesota Smokin' in Steel Championship the prize money for any one of which ranges from five grand to ten thousand dollars it may be a far cry from the brick fire pits that inspired it but backyard grilling has become a staple american pastime like baseball and drinking beer while watching baseball so what do you think how often do you wheel out the grill for a good old-fashioned cookout let us know in the comments below and while you're at it check out some of these weird history food videos